Welcome back to the Famous at Home podcast. Today, singer, songwriter, and worship pastor Matt Redman joins us to talk about emotionally healthy leadership. More than all those other accolades, though, he is a friend, and he graciously gave us time today to talk about his own journey to becoming an emotionally healthy leader. We, we really talk about emotional leadership, healthy leadership, as an act of worship. And we'd love for you to check it out. Also, we'll talk a little bit about what we call the Leader's Heart Cohort. It is a five-month cohort where you get to journey with other like-minded people uh, to be famous at home so that you can thrive on your stage. We'll put the links in there for you to check that out. Without further ado, here is my interview with Matt Redman. Welcome back to the Famous at Home podcast. Today, I am delighted to have uh, a dear friend on the podcast to talk about emotional and spiritual leadership and the balance of that. And my friend today is none other than Matt Redman. Matt, thank you so much for being on the podcast. A pleasure. I come on not as an expert. In the intro there, you make it sound like I'm going to know what I'm talking about here. You know, I invite Matt on to talk about emotional leadership. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, this is how you don't do it. You know, the, the, uh, but that's why I thought I'd come on to try and encourage other people like me who are, who are, you know, try, trying to do better in that area. Oh my goodness. Well, and I, that's what I love about you is, and it's so funny because, um, well, I'm going to tell this story here in a little bit. I got a great story to tell about you, but um, and you're probably wondering what the world that story is. But it, <laughs> it speaks to who you are. I'd love for you uh, to start though, just letting those listening uh, introduce yourself, introduce your family. I mean, most people listening uh, would know you by the songs that they sing, the songs that you've written um, through the years. And uh, uh, we just want to—I just want to start by thanking you for what you have. Um, uh, done for us to help lead us closer to to the Lord in the ways that you write and the ways that you use God's gifts that he's given you um, for all of us. So I just want to start by saying that I'd love for you to introduce your family to us uh, as we talk about being famous at home. Who is your family? Tell us a little bit about them. My lovely wife is called Beth and we've been married uh, 24 years and um yeah we we're uh we're way in there you know that sounds like a very long time when i say it out loud you know it's it's pretty amazing and then uh we've been blessed with five children and so uh, my oldest is called Maisie, and um, she's gonna be 22 and then i have four sons uh, noah rocco jackson levi and so it's never boring in our house. You know, if, if one of the kids, you know, growing up ever came to me and said, Dad, I'm bored. I'm like, that is literally not possible. There's seven people in this family. <laughs> There's got to be something you can do with someone. Don't ever tell me you're bored. Oh, I love it. Yeah, no, it's so great. And you and, and I you talk about what you what you don't do. I I think you know, I think that's what's the beautiful part about this conversation today. And, and for those of you listening, I'd love for you to uh, check out um, Matt's podcast. He has a podcast called Redmond and Riddle that he's done with his friend Jeremy Riddle, where they just talk about worship. They talk about songwriting. They talk about what it means to go into worship. And I just want to say it's such a beautiful podcast in the way you talk about that. And, and I remember, um, so this is a story I want to tell because I think it's a it's a great yeah. uh, segue into into, into our conversation, and it speaks to who you it, it speaks to who you are, Matt. <clears throat> I, I think it's an, important to say that because uh, you started this podcast episode by saying, you know, I'm the one. I'm not an expert. This, I'm saying what not to do, but um, I've been in circles with you, and uh, I can remember one time somebody speaking words of affirmation and encouragement into your life. And, uh, and the way that they described you was that in their interactions with you, that you brought them back to the heart of worship. And in that moment, it was such a beautiful moment because this person had no idea you actually wrote that song. And, and, <laughs> and you just so humbly in that moment said, I wrote that song. And, <laughs> and everyone in the room starts laughing um, because it's so powerful. But, but that's who you are. And, and I think that's what's beautiful is that you live your message. And 
And I think I, the reason I want to ask this question, I'd love for you at some point here to tell us a little bit about the behind the scenes of writing that song, The Heart of Worship, because I think that leadership, leading in our homes, leading with our wives, our kids, those that we get to lead in ministry, there's our leadership is worship at some capacity. How we live our lives is an act of worship. And I'd love for you to share just a little bit about that, how you view that in, in relation to how we lead. Yeah, I mean, that song is um, has an interesting beginning because it, it was literally me describing what was happening in our church. So the pastor felt like we'd lost our way a little bit in terms of our musical worship. And he felt like we've be this become this consumer activity and actually we're meant to be bringing an offering to God here. This isn't meant to be our, about our preferences or I like this song, I like that song, I don't like that worship leader, I like this one. It's too loud, it's too quiet, you know, all that kind of normal stuff. So he he did a quite an extreme thing. And instead of, you know, just speaking gently into that, he said, right, from next week, we're not going to have the sound system. We're not going to have any instruments. We're just going to get in a room with our hearts, our voices, our Bibles, check that we can still find our way to the place of praise and worship. And the point being that when you come through the doors of the church building next week, what are you going to bring as your offering to God? And honestly, it was a bit uncomfortable at first. And I was also thinking, because I was the full-time worship leader, I was thinking, am I fired? You know, like, what, what do I do now? <laughs> and, but actually, it became this beautiful thing where slowly but surely, we came back to the heart of worship and we discovered something really beautiful. And, and so I wrote this song, When the Music Fades, All is Stripped Away, Longing Just to Bring, something that, you know, that's a worth to you, God. And it, and it was... For me, it was like a personal expression. I didn't think it was a congregational thing. And we decided we'd just do the song once and then something took with it. And I guess God was speaking the same thing uh, all around the world. And, and um, so, yeah, so it was kind of fascinating and wonderful seeing that song fly around. And, uh, you know, I'd like to say that was the last time I had to learn that lesson, but... <laughs> But we learn that lesson so often, don't we, with worship, you know, and and, and particularly, you know, just um, the heart of the offering is always the thing. It's so easy to uh, depend on the, out, out, the outer things, maybe not just in the world of worship. You can see a moment in King David's life where he gets towards the end of his life and he tells uh, Joab, the commander of the armies, he says, go and count the fighting men. And Joab is like, no, no, that's an offensive thing to do before the Lord. And David says, go do it anyway. And so he goes, Joab doesn't even count one of the tribes because he knows this is the wrong thing to do. Comes back, but then David realizes this mess up. And the great thing about David, he always repents so fully, doesn't he? So full on. Mm. He, re he returns to true north so quickly. And that's a great thing. But, but you just compare his heart in this moment, this king with all this outer stuff, you know, the fame, the fortune, the power, all that stuff. And you compare it to the heart of that small shepherd boy who went out to fight Goliath with just some sling and some stones and a staff in his hand. And you just see the utter dependence upon God. You see the zeal for the name of God. And you just see, like, sometimes that's what, what we need to watch out for in our lives. You know, when things get, we get trusted with more or we, we, we're running with something really exciting, whether it be a business opportunity or a ministry thing, whatever it is. Whatever God's trust you with, you have to just try and maintain that heart, that small shepherd boy who's just in it for the love of God. And it's a constant lesson, isn't it? Man, it's so good. And I think that's why the song continues to resonate. And, and as I was praying through this episode today and our conversation, for whatever reason, that, that song kept playing over and over in my head. Because I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to, you know, the questions I'm going to ask you, the conversation we're going to have, because you and I have journeyed together, uh, you know, doing this together, you know, this whole idea of, yeah. of living emotionally and and uh, living spiritually before the Lord. But then also, what does that look like for us to be famous at home? What does that look like for us to show up with our wives and our kids? And how do we do that as husbands yeah. and dads? And you know, and, and, and I think that it is an act of worship for us to, you know, you mentioned when you first wrote that song and, and you first did that uh, in, in the church, how awkward it was. It was a bit awkward at first, you said. And I think, I'm, 
I just think entering into, let's take it to a relationship with our wives for a second. Man, there are, how, how often is it? And, and as you know, and, and people listening to the podcast know, one of the things we talk about often is our ability to talk about our emotions, like in the importance of being able to enter into the emotional world of our spouse, our kids, and ourselves. Yeah. Because I genuinely believe that emotion is the gateway to the heart. And I mean, as you said, you know, the shepherd boy, David, I mean, you look through the book of Psalms, that is his, it's a voyeuristic look into, I think, his journal and into his heart. And, and you see the ups and downs, but how awkward it is then to enter into our spouse's life or into our spouse's heart when I'm feeling uh, offended by her, right? I have maybe a little bit of offense or resentment or like, and it's like, okay, now I have to, I have to choose in order to be famous at home. I have to put aside my pride. I have to put aside my, my, uh, my, my wanting to be right, right? Uh, especially if I feel like I've been wronged by her. You know, and I think yeah. what's fascinating, and that can get really awkward. That can get super awkward. But I, you know, I'm going to go back to King David because something you said sparked uh, a verse that I, I keep thinking about. In Psalm 25, verse 11, he says, Lord, for, for the sake of your name. And, and, and I think that as leaders, we, we carry his name. As believers, we are doing what we do in the name of Jesus. We, we are followers of Jesus. We are his, he, he calls us his family. We are his brothers and sisters. So what we do is on behalf of his name, how I treat my wife, how I treat my kids. And, I, and I'm never going to yeah. get it right all the time. Like it's just, it just, we talk about that. But he says, Lord, for the sake of your name, forgive my iniquity, for it is immense. And I would love for you, because here David is looking at his own iniquity going, it's immense. Like, I am a messed up human being. You started yeah. this uh, episode by talking about that. I'd just love for you to speak into that, how, you know, you talk about an offering. I genuinely believe that one of our offerings as leaders, as husbands, as dads, as leaders, and whatever we're called to do, and, and for those women listening, as moms, as, as, as wives, and whatever you're called to do, I think that our first genuine act of leadership is our offering of, Lord, I'm, I, my iniquity is immense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's nothing worse than stuff going amazingly ministry-wise, you know, and, and you're having these great kind of victories and you're getting to lead all these people and these things happening and then you feel like I'm not, I'm not, bringing it at home you know and I, I could give you a yeah. list of all the ways that I want to improve I mean <laughs> my, my wife my wife Beth is so good at trying to set the table in terms of making the home a place of worship and she's like hey you know encouraging us to do more family worship and I'm you know I'm embarrassed because it should be I feel like I'm considering what I do in life I should be the one who's bringing that up first in the conversation and I, you know, I want to grow in that. I want to grow in attunement. You know, that's one of the things that I keep. It it never f fails to amaze me how inept I am at attunement after all this time. I mean, can I you, can, I don't. It doesn't um, come. <clears throat> like I don't know. Attunement? I've it, so I guess talk about that. Yeah. Uh, well, a, so a practical example would for me would be if one of my kids or my wife says something you know like a something that's a big problem to them right now a big you know weighing on them and thing and, and instead of going you know i hear you and i'm in that with you and you know i go my mind goes straight to well, here's how you figure that out and then you i give them the solution you know and uh and i haven't attuned i haven't got in touch haven't met them in that moment or really listened properly and you know it's yeah, I hope I've seen a little bit of growth, but there's some areas I'm like, you know, how am I still so bad at this? I mean, I've I've, I've been trying to, you know, grow in this area. I've been listening to things. I've been on um, things like, you, you know, the, the leader's heart. And um, I guess if I look back over a couple of years, I see growth. Sometimes that's the key, isn't it? You look over a couple of months and you feel a little discouraged, but you look back a bit further and you think, oh, I have moved forward. But I guess there's yeah. just things where it's like, like you said, we, we're always going to be 
struggling to meet some of the standards that we really want for ourselves to meet, um, to be healthy husbands and fathers and friends. And, and um, for me, I, I feel like it took me a long time to realize that I wasn't very healthy in this way. Uh, and what I mean by that is I had a really turbulent childhood. Um, so I lost my father when I was seven. He actually took his own life. My mum remarried. There was some abuse that went on. It was a it was a really really tough um, time. Those teenage years actually it solidified my faith. Honestly, it propelled me towards Jesus. I guess sometimes in those tough moments in life, we choose one path or the other. Some people choose distrust or bitterness with God. And um, by the grace of God, I chose even in the storm to realize that I, I think that I know enough about him to know that he hasn't abandoned me, that God hasn't abandoned me, he hasn't taken his eyes off me, he has a plan for me. And somehow, with the Psalms as my songbook, you know, through those years I chose Jesus. But the, I guess the one thing I think I didn't pay much attention to was emotional health. And I didn't really realize, um, you know, how how below par I was, you know, at, at that. I mean, I... I guess um, the more, the closer the relationships you have and the more that people need you to show up in their lives, then you start to see those things. And so, uh, you know, I had five kids and I had a wife. So there's six people who need me to be emotionally available, need me to be attuning, need me to be um, really in it and present with them. And um, I guess some travel probably didn't help that. But they definitely came a point where, uh, I realized, you know, um, and my wife was very good at, you know, helping me see and my children too, like, hey, you might need to do some work in this area. And so I began a little path of going to some counseling and then end up on things like Leaders Heart. And really it was uh, the first counselor I saw who said, look, the, the emotional health is kind of across the board. It's one thing you can't compartmentalize. You can't be shut down towards your father's death you know when you were seven years old and then completely open and available and alive emotionally towards say your daughter you know that's it doesn't work like that and that that was a real um key moment for me realizing okay that's that's definitely what i've done here i've tried to compartmentalize yeah. and it actually doesn't work um yeah. so yeah just wanting to take some steps even if they're baby steps towards being a bit better in those areas so I can honor God more and honor my wife and kids more, probably my friends too, right? Yeah, no, I love that. And I, and I see that in you. I mean, that's, I think those who probably get to journey with you every day, see that in you. And I, you know, I think you talk about something that's very important there and that is how growth is measured over time. It's like, you know, we can't go to one counseling session and think you're going to come home and be the, you know, most perfect husband and, and dad after one counseling session. And I think Paul, t yeah. uh, well, Paul does talk about that in Galatians 5, you know, I mean, the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and, and patience, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. Those are fruit. I mean, he, Paul uses botanical growth to describe what our spiritual growth is like. And and when you look at botanical growth, you, you don't just watch your, I mean, you can watch your grass grow when it's raining really good for some reason, but yeah, our fruits and our vegetables, like they, they take a long time to grow. You don't just, you know, plant them one day and go out the next and they're there. They take a long time. And I think that yeah. emotional and spiritual growth, are, they, they go hand in hand and you have yeah. to measure that over time. And that's, for those of you listening, that's what the Leaders Heart Cohort's all about. We have a new, uh, a new cohort launching this fall. We'd love for you to sign up for that. That will be in the show notes today. We'll also link that here on YouTube as well. So you can see that uh, down here um, to, to click into that. And that's just a journey. Uh, you know, we'd love to, to answer any questions you have, but it's really a, uh, it's a journey. Uh, it's a cohort of, of, of men. And then we also have a women's one launching in, in January as well. And we'd love for you to apply. We'll put the application process there, but it's a coaching journey where you really get to be in the lives of other leaders and really build trust with one another because I, I think that's another key component of this uh matt is just that sense of as you said being emotionally present for friends you know and just building deep friendships because yeah. i think a lot of times 
as leaders, it's very, it's a very lonely journey. And I can't, I can't imagine how David felt too, you know, King David, you know, during the, during those seasons of his life, how he just clung to the heart of God. Uh, you know, just the ability to be, you know, he talks about crying all night long. He drenches his couch with tears. And I just think there's such a, uh, yeah. an emotional, you know, his ability to emote to God, I think was reflective of, um, you know, even Nathaniel's ability or, or other people's ability to be able to come into his life and speak truth into his life so that, um, yeah. uh, I just, it, it's just, it's just important, you know? And so that's yeah, what I the leader's that. heart is about. Yeah, and I, and I would say, that out. Yeah. um, and I, I think yeah, everyone ahead. who's been on that, I would say they would say I've grown in this area or I've had some progress here. And, it is it is a journey, is it? But I can't think of one person who came who doesn't think that was good for me. That that stretched me. It helped me grow. It helped me um, take a few steps towards becoming a better husband or father or whatever. So, yeah, it's good stuff. And you also um, you'll come back smelling of smoke from the fires at night, and the you might pick up a tick or two, but yeah. you'll be fine. No joke. He won't. He won't. <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> and if you do, we just, yeah, we figure that part out later. If you do, um, that's yeah. all part no, of God's plan for you. So <laughs> in, in, in his full sovereignty. <laughs> I love <Yeah>. it. <laughs> oh, and the best part about Matt is he never fails to, to, to produce the laughter in the group, which, which has been, uh, just amazing. So I'm so appreciative of that. Ho- hopefully, it's um, not a technique I, I, to, uh, you know, distract you from <laughs> my emotional ineptness. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, uh, and it can be, uh, but it's not for you. It's it's great. I I, I appreciate your yeah. humor. I think all the guys do too. <clears throat> um, I want to ask this question. So I, I do want to go back to this because I'd love to hear from you just being a, a true worship artist and, and a worship, somebody who, who writes worship music, how, how you see healthy leadership as an act of worship? Yeah, that's good. Uh, for sure. I mean, it's a fascinating thing. There's a few elements to being on a stage, for example, or being a worship leader. One thing I realized is you can make that stage a barrier if you're not careful and you you know once you get put up the front somewhere people seeing you maybe in a slightly different way or having a certain expectation of you if you're not careful you could use that stage as a barrier to let anyone come into your life Mm -hmm. you know people sometimes don't ask the hard questions of someone on a stage or they don't feel you're approachable and they can be in your life in that way and that's something leaders have to really watch out for i mean actually you can use it as a barrier to god working in your life if you're not careful I mean, cool. it's a, that's a huge thing that's to think word. about, you know, and I think, yeah. And I think sometimes what happens is that a leader gets to a point where they're on stage and then they think, well, now I can't do the, any emotional work or now, you know, I'm supposed to be the, this pastor guy. I'm supposed to be this people, this guy people look up to. So it's too late for me now to do that kind of work. That would be maybe embarrassing or that would be, uh, you know, inappropriate. I don't know what it is. And for me, I think deep in my subconscious, maybe I did carry a bit of that. Like, you know, I'm, I'm this leader on a stage. I can't be going to counseling sessions, you know, and I, and actually, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, good. I heard a leader one time speaking about, don't let your, don't ever let your psychological health or your psychological junk undermine your leadership. And, you know, if, if there's psychological junk there, there's potential for you to trip yourself up or let people down or undermine your leadership in some way. And, you know, think about a lot of the leaders that I know of who've fallen in some way. Quite often you can trace the thing back to there was some psychological junk that didn't get, um, you know, looked at. So it's that. definitely a yep. it's definitely a big, a big deal, you know, that 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 health thing and you know that and I definitely I mean again it's another reason I thought I would come on here this you know this kind of the nature of this podcast you know I have a friendship with you so that's that's probably the biggest reason I'm on it but you know I don't kind of volunteer to talk about things like 
this, but the reason is also because I sometimes it's good to dispel these myths. You know, people see a worship leader and because they're so connected, because there's some truth in the songs, or maybe the song helped them in a real intense moment in their life, or showed up as a soundtrack in that moment. They they kind of see you as you know, in the worst case scenario, it's kind of holy man or something. I'm not, you know, I don't think many people do, but there's a few people yeah. who they give you a whole pass on everything and they think you're better than you are at everything because you've shown up, your song's shown up in their life in a special way and the Holy Spirit's used that. And, you know, it's good to dispel those myths. You know, I'm just a guy, you know, I'm, I need to be a much better husband. I need to be a much better father I'm a way better songwriter than I am at those things and that's discouraging to me and I think one of the reasons I haven't worked on it I need to work on it in this season of my life the last five years I just think it's so essential for leaders uh, you got to let people into your lives you got to not use the stage as a barrier and you got to be really honest with where you're at I guess you know yeah Oh, it's so good. And I think that's where the friendships come into play or the people that you can trust. And, you know, to me, I, I, I think, you know, the people that I, I think one of the reasons I pursue this so much is because, at least in my own life, is because I have other people, I have men in my life who will keep me accountable, who will who will call me out when they see things that, that you know, aren't congruent to, to the things that I talk about, to the way that I live my life. And I also have a wife who isn't all of that, um, impressed with me. So at least from the pub, what, what you see in the public, right? Like she, she sees everything and she could, I mean, she's impressed with me. She loves me dearly. She's my biggest yeah. fan. But, uh, at the same time, she also knows like, Hey dude, like, you know, and it takes me a minute cause it, you know, obviously yeah. it, it hurts my pride. So it takes you a minute to come back and go, I'm sorry. And, and I, I know I need to work on that. But, uh, but I think that those, that's huge to listen to those people in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And and then the good part is, I definitely think I've seen some progress. Like I said earlier, you know, a few of our kids have been through surgeries this year. And it, and it was interesting because it was one moment where, where I realized, I think I've moved forward a bit. Like, I do feel like I got in the game with them and walked them through that and let them know I was very present with them. And, you know, saw that as an opportunity for some amazing one on one time. And I feel like I had some wonderful heart connections with my sons in that moment and, and my daughter too actually she had appendix out and you know and so that that's encouraging I feel like 10 years ago I wouldn't have handled this moment so well I would have just been a robot like I'm pretty good at getting tasks done you know here comes the insurance yeah. forms I got them to the thing on time I got them all the meds ready you know I checked in on them three times a day and did their bandages and you know I can do all that stuff but I feel like 10 years ago that's all I would have done and I look now, I think, no, I, I think I went into this in very intentionally and like try to really do eye to eye and just tell them I was with them in the key moments. And, you know, so so that's encouraging to me, too, because although I've mentioned my ineptness twice, you know, I, I feel like I've seen a little bit of um, ineptitude. Is that the word? Maybe ineptness isn't a word, but um, yeah, so I need to work yeah, on my... Yeah my yeah. language as well as my parenting and my everything else yeah. but i guess what i'm saying is i've seen some uh, i've seen some growth and that's encouraging yeah no and and you know what's i'd love for you to speak to that because and i get to see part of your journey and just even um i think there's a confidence level that we gain when we do show up well and you know you as a worship leader and and i, I want to make sure that i highlight this because i think it was important you you, you alluded to it, but, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about calling and character, right? And, you know, you're, you, you mentioned that you feel like you're a better worship writer sometimes than you are, you know, uh, a husband or a dad, and, and, and that, those, that that comes more naturally to you, I think, than, than, than the relational side of it. Um, I, I think there's a degree to which if we don't nurture that relational side, that character, you know, the calling will outpace us and it will catch up to us. And, and I think that's, yeah. that's exactly, you know, when, when we use the stage as a barrier and that type of thing. And I mean, I do that. I mean, I, I tend to use work is safe for me. So when I'm not fe when I'm not doing well in my life, when things aren't going well, 
I go to work. I just, and it's not even that I'm productive. I just stay busy because at least it feels safe, right? And, and that's one thing yeah. that I've noticed about myself is I tend to withdraw whenever I'm not doing well or things aren't going well. And, and I just go into work. And now Christy knows that too, because it's pretty well known. So now she'll call me out. She'll be like, are you actually doing anything that's productive? Um, and, and, it's, and it's also one of those things that when you work <laughs> together and she knows the ins and outs of everything that we do. She's like, what are you working on? Do you really need to be working on that? You know, so so I have an extra layer of accountability now. I just can't That's go good. to work and, and expect to hide there. But um, yeah. Oh, I lost you for 10 seconds there. It lost you there for a minute, yeah. Yeah, I lost you there too. I got, I got you back now. So I want to ask you this question in, in light of what you were just talking about with your kids and with showing up, you know, over the last 10 years, uh, I think, you know, you've done, you know, you've talked about doing counseling, obviously leaders, heart cohort, those types of things that you have really entered into your kids' worlds and, and starting to, um, you feel like do a better job of that. What does the phrase famous at home mean to you? I mean, I guess it would mean to me. If uh, if I got to the end of my life and my wife and my kids were uh, pretty happy about how I'd treated them and how I'd shown up in their lives, and that would outweigh the other stuff, you know. Like I said earlier, the worst thing is to be, you know, you're winning a, awards for certain music things and this and that, but you're like, I got to do better at home, you know. The, this is. This is this is the biggest entrustment God's given me, and um, I need to take yeah. this entrustment yeah. more seriously. Then you know, and um, and that would be a cool thing to be known as, wouldn't it? To be known as a a father who really showed up for his kids, and of uh, you know, a husband who really um, gave him amazing amounts of in, emotional attention to his wife that stuff would outweigh the other stuff wouldn't it the other it, it feels it feels like um uh you know that would just be a beautiful thing like if you've been at a funeral and you hear like a some kids giving a speech about their dad and they were just so you could tell this isn't they're not just trying to say the right things because the guy's not here anymore to, you know th this is fr from the heart these kids he was in their life in such a, um, you know, huge way. Then you know that 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 stuff seems to be like the some of the greatest treasure you can find, right? And, I, and that would, mm -hmm. so I guess for me that would be, that would be what it is, um, you know. And you, you know, and also for them to think that I had good character. If I felt like my kids, or my wife felt I had good character, I don't know why, but that means a lot to me because I think you are the people who know me the best. Yeah. You know, someone who sings oh, my songs, 100%. who's never met me, who's ridiculous, they're going to think I have good character. They're going to think, oh, he must be close to God. And uh, But if someone who's, you know, in your life in that way says it, that would mean a lot. And you mentioned character. I think that's, at the end of the day, it's one of the key words. It's not really a popular word in our culture today. Um, it, you know, 50 years ago, people were looking... To lead us in the in this world for character and they're not really looking for character anymore right i mean the average yeah, person seems like we're yeah. happy just to be charismas replaced it yeah and you know and that's Charisma. always been a thing Charisma's to a degree yeah 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 for sure and yeah. one leader he said um you know the real test in these days will not be in the writing and producing of new and great worship music the real test will be in the godliness and the character of those who deliver it and for me, that's everything, you know, it's, you know, and uh, I once heard it described like this, like a, it's like with a boat, with a boat, um, really one of the most important things is, is what's under the waterline and the unseen stuff. And so, for example, you could have a nice looking boat, it's got a nice mast and decks and shiny and looks awesome in every way sitting there in the harbour. Um, but someone who's like a nautical engineer or knows about boats, they wouldn't just be concerned with what it looked like in the harbour. They'd be thinking about what's it like when we get out in the open waves then. For example, the ballast side of things. Does does what's below the waterline outweigh what's above the waterline? Because if it doesn't, 
it's fine sitting there in the harbour, but when it gets out into any kind of waves or turbulent weather, um, there's going to be a problem and it's basically going to capsize, right? And that's that's really what it's like, you know. Uh, in those kind of chill moments in life, when there's no pressure and that, we can all sit in the harbour there looking good. But what happens in those storms? What happens when you're trusted with a lot in life? What happens... Um, you know, in, in those moments, you know, are we going to still be able to, you know, uh, stay upright? You know, is what's below the waterline, in other yeah. words, the character, is that outweighing all those public side of things and the gifts and that? It's so key. Oh, it's so key. And I think, I mean, eventually it's going to catch up to you. It's going to catch up to you in some way, whether it's burnout, whether it's, you know, um, as you said earlier, you know, just uh, people who have ethical or moral failures in some type of way. Um, it's just, it's the lack of paying attention to what's under the hood or, you know, what's going on in the, in the boat, it, it's going to catch up. And, and, and that's yeah. my heart is, and I go back to the Psalm 25 where it says, uh, for your namesake, like you, I'm walking in his name. I am leading in his name and I want to honor his name. I want to do everything I can to honor his name. Am I going to always get it right? Am I going to be perfect? No. But uh, I think it goes back to that verse uh, to really seek him in my iniquity, to, to ha- seek his forgiveness, because the more that I can stay humbled in that regard, um, the, yeah. the, the better protection I have in leading well and also um, honoring his name, you know? Yeah, I, I want to um, ask you this because I, I oh go ahead. You were going to say something. Um. I was going to add one aside. I was talking to someone who does a similar job to you, runs something, and he, he, he said, "You know, the one kind of person we don't get on this." And I was like, "No." And he goes, "Pastors." You know, so it's a little word to any pastors out there. He says, "Pastors is this got? They're not often willing to let the walls down or take that step into vulnerability, and um, you know, because they've become accustomed to I've got to keep things together here." So that's just a little yeah. aside to add yeah. to that. Well, and, it, and I think it's an important one because, you know, the, the work that I do the most with is, is our military officers. And, and I mean, the, oh, yeah. the, the guys that I work with, are, they're trained to capture or kill. And, and I'm talking to them about emotions. And, and it's like, and yet they're the ones who eat this up more than anybody else, more than pastors, more than church leaders. Uh, and again, this, I'm speaking generally, this is what I have seen anecdotally in my life and, and just the people I speak to, the places I'm invited to do this type of thing. And, and I think they realize that the very thing that they're trained to turn off to survive in the battlefield is the thing that they have to turn back on to survive when they get back home. Wow. And that's why it's so powerful for them. That's why they eat this stuff up is because they want to genuinely be the best in every area of life that they can be. And yeah. it, it, it saddens me a lot for, for church leaders when I say, when, when we talk about this and there's just this wall that comes up and you can see the wall that comes up, you know, when you're having conversations yeah. in this regard. And I think there's, you know, just to be um, compassionate towards that, I think there's, there's been plenty of times that church leaders have been hurt and, and they don't trust very easily. But at the same time, I've also seen church leaders who, you know, deal with anxiety. They're very open about that. You know, we, we're going to have um, Pastor Scott Sauls here on a podcast in a few more weeks, and he just wrote a book on yeah. how he's dealt with his anxiety. And, and it's like, you know, these are, and I know Pastor Louis Giglio has talked about that. And, 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 and it's like when, when pastors get vulnerable, when they, get, when they find people they can trust and they enter into their inner worlds, they become like King David in the book of Psalms where your ministry becomes, it's like it goes on steroids because there's a different connection yeah. to the heart. And, and, I, and I'm saying this as yeah. an ordained pastor. I'm saying this as somebody who ha- has been a church leader and, and leads and volunteers in my own church that the healthier, my ministry has only gotten more, um, I believe, Holy Spirit powerful. The Holy Spirit's been more powerful through me as a result of knowing what's going on in my inner world and doing my own work than than when I was completely that person because I was that wasn't willing to go in there or it wasn't even that I wasn't willing. I think it's that I didn't see it. 
um, yeah. and, uh, and and maybe wasn't willing to see it at the time. So I appreciate you saying that because I, I think that there's a there's a, there's a reality to that where we get scared to to enter into that space. Yeah, that's good. I like your King David example as I, well I, because you think about it, he was a military man who was very emotionally alive. So that's pretty cool. Oh man, it's so cool. And I, I mean, you started with it, yeah. And, and I think we have to look both to we have to look both to King David, but then also, as you said in the beginning, Shepherd Boy David. Like there's a, you know, you don't want to lose that inner child. You don't want to lose that, yeah. that inner child. That's like, you know, um, because I think when you lose that is when you, you know, that's when you, the Bathsheba incidents, the Uriah, like, and then you yeah. have your Nathans coming to you and they're like, Hey, you know, I'm gonna, you, you can't be doing this dude. Like, what are you doing? You know? So, um, I, I want to ask you this cause I, I, I I'm thinking about those people listening just as we uh, wrap up here, but I think of the people listening right now who are, they are, they're leaders. They are people who are working full-time jobs, uh, maybe both parents working full-time jobs. um, And yet they also are raising young kids uh, or maybe even teenagers and life is just really, really busy. And they're going, man, I just don't even know where to begin. Like, I don't, like, I, I want to be doing a good job. It's kind of like what you alluded to earlier, where it's like I, I'm the worship guy, and yet I feel ashamed because I'm not leading my house in worship the way that my wife is. You know, she's the one who's doing this. And, and I, I, as a, you know, I, I feel that. I feel that sense of like, man, I'm failing. I'm not praying with my kids enough. I'm not reading the Bible enough to them. I'm not leading my, I'm not doing as many date nights with my wife as I think I should. But yet I'm working. My life is busy. At the end of the day, I'm just exhausted. What, because I know you've been there. I know you've been in those seasons. You get it. How, what advice would you give or what encouragement would you give to those people who are just going, I get all of this, I understand it, but I just don't have, I don't know where the margin is for me to, to take the next step. Yeah, I mean, um, I think sometimes it can be daunting, even if, especially if you're in a big family, because like you say, I've got to try and find one-on-one time with everyone. And honestly, that's the thing yeah, my kids yeah. seem to want more than anything. They want that one-on-one time with Beth or with myself. And so that's an important thing i mean a, a lot of um what i noticed in myself a while back is all how is it that when it's a work situation i always seem to find the energy right uh, so it, i could be depleted but something comes up and i attack it and i get it done even though it meant you know not getting enough sleep or something or maybe you know the end of a meeting someone comes up and they want to tell you this story you got nothing left but sometimes you but you find something in the tank for that person and then i realized oh i i don't know if i do that at home though like uh, so wow. what i realized is quite often there is something in the tank wow. but i'm just being lazy i've i've switched into a mode wow. of like it's me time now you know and uh i've already yeah. done all this i got nothing left but I realized in work situations, I always find something, you know, I always find a little bit more in the tank or I always, but I've realized in family situations, I let myself, you know, oh, oh well, I haven't literally haven't got anything, you know? So that was a big thing yeah. for me to see and own. And I've talked to other friends about that and they've all said, oh yeah, that's me too. <laughs> that's me too. You're like I can yeah. keep going in any work situation, but in the family, I'm, I'm, there's a laziness or a, I don't know what the, even what the word is. Um, and, and then the other flip side of that is when you start engaging. So I could come home after leading five worship services and I'm really, you know, feeling a little bit like I just really would love, you know, I need, I'm an introvert most of the time. So I kind of would like some recharge time and then I'm physically tired. And then one of your kids wants something. And what I realized is also the moment you do engage with them, normally that little wall of uh, whatever it is stopping you do that, that disappears. Like five minutes in, I'm enjoying time with them. So We're true. having a connection. We've so gone and, maybe we've gone and done a bike ride or something or we've done. And I realized, oh, man, that was almost like a lie keeping me 
from this because yeah you know i i'm once i engage in it it that all that that um hesitance disappears completely so it's something i realized yeah. you know yeah. it, a little pattern in my life and, and um i did you know, like i said i've spoke to a few friends who've had a very similar feeling about the dynamic yeah no and i a hundred i think everybody listening is listening right now going yes that is me i resonate with that and I was going to, when you said the, the flip side of that is, before you said that, I was going to jump in and be like, yeah, but don't you also find, because that's my experience, that whenever I struggle to say yes to the kids or even to Christy, once I do, it's like, like just the other night, Christy said to me, she's like, because throughout the day, we, we're working, uh, we're balancing work, we're balancing the kids, we're entering our kids' world. Now, it's summertime right now, so we're not homeschooling, but we also homeschool, so we're kind of we're, we're, we're in everything and, and there's so many moving parts in a day and I'll, I'll, I get to the end of the day often and I'm like, where'd the day go? Like seriously, like it just goes by. But usually what ends up happening is, and this has been a pattern we've gotten into recently, is I'm not on my phone a lot throughout the day. She's not on her phone through a lot throughout the day because we're just uh, so many things happening that we've gotten the kids down. And lately in the past couple of days, we've gotten into this pattern of, of, of going onto our phones after the kids are down. And, and Christy said to me the other, last night, just last night, she said, Josh, she said, we have to put our phone, we have to not jump to our phones because I miss connecting with you once the kids are down. And, and for me, I was go, yeah. I, there's this little thing inside going, but I, I just, I want to check the news. I want to check, like I haven't caught up on anything throughout the day. And, and I'm realizing, oh, I do need to find other time. Cause it was like that, like you said, that was my me time. That was my, you know, and now I'm putting that away, but I did, we did it the last, uh, last night. So it must've been a couple of nights ago is the last two nights we've just sat together and man, it was just, you're right. It's glorious. Like there's something about it that I'm like, that is so much more fulfilling than me w r catching up on the day's news and, and everything else from the day. I, I, I just, I feel seen. I feel like I see Christy, but it just, it, it's that initial, like, how do you get over that hump? And I think for each of us, for those yeah. of you listening, just that first, yes, just that first, yes. And it's not these big changes that need to happen. It's just that first, yes. When your kids come running to you during the, you know, as you get home or, um, you know, daddy, look at this. Or, you know, I think so often we can see those as annoying little like, daddy, look at this picture. Look at this thing. And, you know, my daughter just came to me this morning. Daddy, can we play Uno tonight? And I'm like, Uno, of course. That takes, you know, three minutes, you know. Our, our son will say, hey, dad, can we play Monopoly? And I'm like, oh, boy, I, buddy, I, I love you. <laughs> but, you know, like that's a that's a two-hour commitment right there. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah. so but being able to just say yes to those things, you know. Our kids light up in those one-on-one -on -one moments. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for, for, for joining. I do want to just uh, encourage people, those of you listening, um, you know, you want un to understand more of this. You want to enter into it. You want to do it for real. Uh, the Leaders Heart Cohort is launching again this fall. We would absolutely love to have you. We have a men's uh, cohort launching this fall. We have a women's cohort launching in January of 23. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a great time to be able to Gain, gain new friendships, but also be able to go deep with those people and really develop safe relationships, people that you can trust who are on this journey to becoming famous at home so that they can thrive on their stages. And uh, Matt, I just want to thank you again. Um, it's always uh, a pleasure being with you. Um, uh, you're a joy to be with. And I, and I, I genuinely believe that for those listening, um, I, I think that they would have taken that same thing away uh, you, you, you pursue the heart of worship and, um, and, and it comes out of who you are. And I just want to thank you for all that you've poured into me or that you pour into to everyone around the world. Uh, because at the end of the day, Thanks, I think man. what really matters in this whole conversation of being famous at home is it starts by, by knowing that we're already famous in our heavenly home with him and, uh, and that yeah. offering and, and his presence and, and you lead us to that. So thank you. No, so good. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and cheering you on. Love what you do. Thank you so much, Matt. It's an honor. Talk soon. Until next week, keep in mind that the greatest red carpet you will walk is through your front door.